The long struggle that would go down in history as World War II began when the Allies took on the might of Adolf Hitler in 1939, as he stormed through Europe with devastating speed and efficiency, crushing nation after nation. As thousands of British and French troops awaited rescue on the beaches of Dunkirk, the humiliating defeats of 1940 made it clear that Hitler and the Germans were a force to be reckoned with. But as more countries became engaged in the web of conflict, the tide slowly but surely began to turn. With Allied victories in North Africa in 1942, and the invasion of Sicily in 1943, while the Russians stood firm on the Eastern Front, both the Allied forces and Adolf Hitler's axes of evil knew that an attack on Northwest Europe was imminent. Four years after Dunkirk, the steel masts of the Allied ships would cross the English Channel once more but this time to liberate France from oppression and free Europe from Nazi occupation. The Normandy landings of 1944 boasted the largest seaborne invasion in history, and this extraordinary event will now be revisited during the course of this programme, D-Day and beyond. After many twists and turns in the European conflict, by 1943, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the American President Franklin D. Roosevelt were immersed in schemes for a combined offensive on Germany. In July, initial plans were put in place for a mass landing on the northwest coastline of France, and these were discussed with the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, at the Tehran Conference later that year. Many important decisions had to be made for the operation codenamed Overlord, and first and foremost, it had to be settled where the invasion should take place. The quickest and easiest route for the Allies would be over the Pas de Calais, but this is exactly what the Axis commanders expected. The element of surprise was so vital to the landings that a more complicated route was eventually chosen, and three beaches in the Khan Bayou region of Normandy were selected. For such a comprehensive landing, preparation was the key factor, and the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, known as Shafe, was set up to begin extensive planning. Although many expected US Chief of Staff George C. Marshall to be put in control of the organization, the American commander, who had successfully led his troops to victory in Africa and Italy, was not selected, and instead General Dwight D. Eisenhower was put in charge of operations. Alongside Eisenhower, the British general Bernard Montgomery helped shape plans for the invasion. Montgomery had first-hand experience of warfare, having fought on the Western Front in the First World War. He had also commanded forces at Dunkirk and claimed many victories during the North African campaign, and along with Eisenhower, decided that three landing areas would not be enough. Instead, they chose five beaches between Cherbourg and Le Havre. Churchill described this line of landing zones as a 50-mile half-moon of sandy beaches. And if the landings in this half-moon proved successful, it would be possible to establish a beachhead with adequate ports. Then the plan to drive along the lines of the Loire and Seine rivers into the heart of France, instigating the liberation of Europe, could begin in earnest. The American Army divisions would land at beaches codenamed Utah and Omaha, while the British and Canadian troops would come ashore on the three remaining beaches, Gold, Juno and Sword. Upon arrival, 
The plan was then to reinforce the troops and drop off as many soldiers as quickly as possible. But the task was far from being an easy one, and having suffered a terrible defeat two years earlier, after an attack on the north coast of France, the Allies were all too aware of the risks involved. The Dieppe Raid of 1942 led to the loss of thousands of Canadian and British lives, and Lord Mountbatten, who'd overseen the attack, later claimed that, for every man who died in Dieppe, at least ten more must have been spared in Normandy. Having learnt hard lessons from 1942, the main problem the Allies had to overcome while planning the Normandy landings was the fact that there were no harbours along the selected beaches, so a landing and unloading area had to be created. In his famous memo to Mountbatten, Churchill had demanded piers that would float up and down with the tide. Today, Along the beaches of northern France, the remains of the Allies' solution to this challenging problem can still be seen, namely a Mulberry Harbour. When John Hughes Hallett became the Naval Chief of Staff for Operation Overlord, it's believed the idea of creating these incredible portable constructions began to take shape. Having been part of the raid at Dieppe, he announced that if a port could not be captured, one should be taken across the channel. Consequently, in the months prior to the operation, giant concrete building blocks were secretly constructed to create two mulberries. The one codenamed A was for the American troops at Omaha, while Mulberry B would be at gold for the British and Canadian troops. The mission under preparation was on a mammoth scale, and the Allies even began creating a sister operation to be launched the same day as Overlord. Eisenhower was keen on causing a diversion from the action in Normandy and made plans for a small army from the Mediterranean to land on the south coast of France in Operation Anvil. The Americans believed that this would distract German forces and relieve pressure on the troops landing in the north. The British, on the other hand, were reluctant to spare men desperately needed for the Italian campaign in the south, which continued to push for Rome. As the main overlord mission developed, Anvil took a back seat, and with the precious landing ship tanks, better known as LSTs in great demand, Churchill even wrote to President Roosevelt asking for as many as possible to be transferred from the Anvil mission to Operation Overlord. The Americans didn't appreciate Churchill's attitude towards Anvil, but suddenly an unforeseen event brought the dispute to a hasty conclusion. Just six weeks before D-Day, which had been scheduled for June the 5th, 1944, a rehearsal for the landings, codenamed Exercise Tiger, was taking place in Devon. Everything appeared to be going to plan, with 30,000 troops practicing the assault at Slapton Sands, when on the sixth day of rehearsal, disaster struck. German U-boats on patrol from Cherbourg came across the Allied convoy and torpedoed five of the landing ships. The vessels were fundamental to both the Anvil and Overlord operations, and the loss of such vital equipment forced the Americans to reluctantly postpone Anvil and concentrate all resources on the Normandy landings. The Slapton Sands disaster not only resulted in the loss of ships, but also tragically, 700 American servicemen died. This was a great blow to the Allies, but rehearsals were vital in the months leading up to the main mission 
and continued to take place regularly. Although rehearsing such a large operation proved difficult to hide from the German army, one of the main reasons D-Day was such a success was the extraordinary precautions Schaeff took to conceal their plans. The main objective was to convince German intelligence and Adolf Hitler that an attack would come from Kent bound for Calais. So for every reconnaissance flight over Normandy, two scouting planes were flown over the Pas de Calais. In fact, Calais itself was bombed by a thousand American planes and German intelligence became even more convinced that this was where the Allied invasion was going to be targeted. If further proof was needed, dummy landing craft were also introduced, which were strategically placed in the Thames estuary and the Channel ports. The work and effort put into making sure the Germans thought a large attack was bound for Calais was so immense and complex that it was even recognised as a shadow mission and given the code name Fortitude. Another decoy plan was the creation of an entire fake army, the first United States Army Group, which appeared to be a completely functional unit, perfect in every detail, but lacking just one vital element – real soldiers. Phony inflatable tanks and trucks made of rubber gave the impression of movement and training, and it's hardly surprising the Germans fell for the subterfuge not least because the highest-ranking American commander, George S. Patton, was put at the helm of the 1st United States Army Group, giving even more credibility to the deception. Even so, despite all this planning, a distinct lack of German aerial reconnaissance meant that some of this activity went unnoticed. One of the most elaborate red herrings was the clever plan to increase wireless traffic in order to help generate propaganda for the non-existent units. This, teamed with the use of double agents, made Operation Fortitude an ingenious and effective mission, and Hitler became so certain that the attack was going to take place over the Pas de Calais that he began strengthening his 15th Army, which was stationed there, into a defensive position. Meanwhile, the French resistance, which had been a growing force since 1940, needed to be informed that an attack was imminent, and the British communicated their plans in two cryptic coded messages. The long sobs of violins of autumn, and wound my heart with a monotonous languor, by wireless, courtesy of the BBC. Hello, forces. Once again, this is Joan Griffith saying thank you. German intelligence soon discovered the significance of the code words after interrogating members of the resistance, but they dismissed them as just another of the many decoys. The German commander Erwin Rommel, charged personally by Hitler with securing the Nazi position in France, also doubted the Allies would risk announcing such important operations over the radio. As plans came together and more people were informed of the scheme, the Allies' fears that information would leak into the wrong hands began to grow. As well as preparing one of the biggest amphibious invasions in history and trying to divert attention away from all military activities, Schaeff also had the difficult task of concealing every single element of the planning process. A strict, top-secret scheme was put in place called the Bigot System, which kept check on exactly who had access to the completed Overlord plans, using specially appointed Bigot officers. Obviously, as time went on and D-Day approached, the different divisions were briefed on the types of terrain they would have to fight on, and the type of resistance they would face. However, fear of information spreading was so great that the soldiers and forces who were given vital data were kept under strict supervision and, in some cases, kept behind the kind of barbed wire fences you'd expect to find in a concentration camp. 
One of the most alarming events for Shaif was the disastrous rehearsal at Slapton Sands, as ten bigot officers were travelling on the boats that were attacked. And if they'd been captured, it would have, in effect, meant the end of Overlord before it had even begun. All further planning was put on hold until the long and gruesome task of searching the Slapton area to unearth all ten bodies was complete, and only then could Shaif relax in the knowledge that their secrets were still safe. Protecting all intelligence related to Overlord was crucial, and officers could be reprimanded or even sent home for telling close friends or family confidential information. And it wasn't just idle gossip that concerned Shaif, but also the daunting task of keeping vast quantities of bigot documents under control. A window left casually open caused great panic when a gust of wind blew 12 copies of bigoted documents into a busy London street one day. And an even more dramatic event occurred in Exeter when a railway employee found a complete set of overlord plans in a briefcase abandoned in a train compartment. If these had fallen into German hands, the whole mission would have been a failure. Thankfully, in both cases, the documents were swiftly returned. As June the 5th drew closer, an unseasonable change in weather placed a strain on preparations. The landings needed sufficient moonlight to illuminate the path of the ships, as well as the correct tidal patterns. And when a great storm was forecast for the day when these conditions combined perfectly, Eisenhower had one of the biggest decisions of his military career to tackle. The American commander knew that if he postponed for longer than a day, the operation would have to wait a whole fortnight for the tide to be just right. Two weeks was a long time, and with so many close calls in security breaches, this was a great risk to take. If the mission was postponed, Eisenhower could not be sure the operation could be concealed. There were also the issue of the thousands of troops already with their LSTs ready for battle. And by the beginning of June, there were three million servicemen aboard the ships to consider. And finding a safe and secret place for them to disembark without detection would be virtually impossible. As the streets of southern Britain, so recently bustling with military activity, fell strangely silent and the waves churned beneath the ships, Eisenhower, faced with appalling weather conditions, made the decision to postpone D-Day from the 5th to the 6th of June. The sea was still likely to be stormy and the journey very unpleasant for the men, but there would be just enough improvement to make things a little easier. The troops now had to wait 24 hours while their ships were battered by storms and gales until finally Eisenhower made the brave decision in the first minutes of the 6th of June to give the go-ahead. Before the landings on the beaches commenced, many airborne attacks took place in order to secure the flanks of the landing zones and capture key locations. Many of these targets were bridges along the River Orne, and this group of assaults was codenamed Operation Tonga.
perhaps the most crucial of all the strategic points was the now famous Pegasus Bridge, which lies three miles south of Wistraholm and close to the charming town of Benneville. The mission was fraught with uncertainty as six horser gliders were used to carry 181 men under the command of Major John Howard with the tough task of taking both Pegasus and then Ranville Bridge. It was vital to secure both bridges intact as they'd be crucial for allowing the landing troops to advance east along the coast and capturing Pegasus Bridge would also delay any German counterattack on Sword Beach and prevent enemy reinforcements from getting through. After the precarious flight across the channel, Major Howard's glider was released over France and came to an abrupt halt on French soil at 16 minutes past midnight. The plan had been to use the nose of the horser to break through the heavy barbed wire surrounding the bridge, but landing off target some 50 yards away, the nose broke on impact and the two pilots were thrown from the cockpit while everyone else on board was knocked unconscious. The situation could have been disastrous, but luck was on the Allies' side and German defence forces dismissed the crashing noise as falling debris. Meanwhile, Major Howard's men recovered and divisions from all the gliders worked quickly to secure the area. 26-year-old Lieutenant Brotheridge led one of the divisions and battled to secure half of the bridge but sadly became the first Allied soldier to be killed by enemy fire on D-Day when the Germans retaliated. With the element of surprise working in their favour, Pegasus Bridge was quickly taken from the Germans and the French greeted the British soldiers as heroes. At the Café Gondre, champagne that had been hidden from the Nazis was dug up from the garden to celebrate the beginning of the liberation of France. However, Allied paratroopers landing on the western edge of the Normandy beaches did not receive such a warm welcome. The horrendous storms and terrible visibility caused the paratroopers to land up to 25 miles off course, and as Erwin Rommel had flooded many of the suitable areas, a significant number of troops drowned under the weight of their kit. Those fortunate enough to avoid landing in the man-made boggy marshes had to face Rommel asparagus, in effect long poles driven into the ground, booby-trapped with mines, which could do tremendous damage. Many Allied lives were lost in these initial assaults, but this support mission was of vital importance if the D-Day invasion was to stand any chance of succeeding. Similarly, the aerial and naval bombardment of the beachheads, which took place just before the troops disembarked, was essential in preparing the ground for attack. Each stretch of shoreline would have a very different set of circumstances awaiting the troops, but every division had a crucial role to play in what was fast becoming a huge overall picture. The invasion began with the most westerly beach of Utah, closest to the port of Cherbourg. Running for about three miles, Utah was located between Poupeville and Le Madeleine. Over 30,000 American troops and 3,500 vehicles were in position by 2 a.m., ready to attack at first light. After an initial bombardment, a raid party swam out to a suspected German observation post and the swimmers, armed only with knives, found the post to be completely deserted. And the same was true all along Utah Beach, as the Allies discovered that the luck was on their side. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, the former American president's eldest son, was the oldest man to land that morning at 57 years old. He was the only general who'd requested to join his squadron, and although his commander was reluctant to let him go, his wishes were approved. 
As the first wave began landing, General Roosevelt was among the troops. However, it was soon clear things had not gone according to plan. The weather conditions were so terrible and visibility so poor that nearly all the ships had veered off course. Roosevelt's division landed at least a mile off target, which could have had disastrous consequences. Fortunately, there were few German soldiers stationed along the shore, which was a very different reception than the heavy defence that had actually awaited them at their intended landing point. Slightly confused and having to orientate himself, Roosevelt famously said, We'll start the war from here and after surveying the area, managed to locate the causeways that would lead the troops inland. Luck certainly played a part in the Utah landings, but the sheer element of surprise was the real reason why this long stretch of beach was unguarded, proving that Schaaf had undoubtedly fulfilled their top-secret mission to keep Operation Overlord concealed. The only German troops put on high defensive alert were the 15th Army in the Pas de Calais. Rommel saw no reason to have the 7th Army, who were defending the northwest coast as well as Brittany, put on alert. And ironically, nearly all the senior commanders of this division had been sent away for an exercise based upon a theoretical Allied invasion of Normandy. Rommel who would be called to account in the event of an invasion, was so convinced that no one in their right mind would invade in such terrible weather conditions, chose to leave the field of battle, returning home to his wife in Germany to celebrate her birthday. The Allied forces had never carried out a landing without forecasts of extended periods of clear weather, and as Schaaf had carefully concealed all traces of the massive operation underway, Rommel truly believed that there was not the remotest chance of an attack. Relatively few lives were lost at Utah Beach, with the vast majority of the tanks arriving on land intact, and there were only in the region of 200 Allied casualties. These figures were a credit to the airmen who'd worked tirelessly to clear the exit routes from the beach, five hours before the troops were due to land. But sadly, by the end of the operation, almost a third of the airborne division had been lost, which although a seemingly high price to pay, no doubt prevented the battle for Utah being as horrific as that experienced by the Americans on Omaha, the next beach along the Normandy coastline. The objectives of the American troops at Omaha Beach were, firstly, to secure a length and depth of five miles, and then advance and join the British troops landing at Gold Beach. Problems with navigation, not least due to the stormy weather, were very difficult to overcome, and although this had worked in favour of the Americans at Utah, at Omaha they found themselves coming ashore right in the line of fire of the highly trained German 352nd Division, who were defending this part of the Normandy coast. At half past six in the morning, the first wave of assault barges laden with men left the ships, but as they approached Omaha Beach, the carnage began. 
Artillery fire sliced through the air, and many men were killed or injured before they could even reach the shore. Amidst the chaos, 29 of the backup tanks were released too early from their landing ship, and all but two sank into the stormy seas along with their crews, leaving the soldiers on Omaha to face the enemy without adequate support. With the confusion over navigation, infantry divisions were separated, and as commanders fell alongside their men, the remaining troops were left to use their own initiative in order to regroup and create footholds. Brave engineers aided the battle, desperately attempting to clear the beaches of deadly mines, but many were killed as intense gunfire set the explosives off, and as the second wave of troops arrived, they were faced with a scene of chaos and utter devastation. Despite the horror they faced, the brave allies forged ahead with their mission, and a short distance away, American rangers encountered an equally difficult set of circumstances. Situated high upon a 100-foot cliff face between Utah and Omaha was a German defense station at Pointe du Hoc, which housed a battery of guns captured from the French. Because of the strategically difficult position, neither aerial nor naval bombardment had been able to destroy the enemy stronghold. So a small battalion of just over 200 men of the US 2nd Rangers were sent to destroy the battery and seize Point du Hoc. Under the command of Colonel James E. Rudder, they scaled the cliffs using ropes and ladders, but while attempting the treacherous climb, many were killed by enemy fire as they advanced up the rock face. However, a number of them managed to courageously continue until they reached their target and successfully take the point. For two days, the 90 surviving rangers fought tirelessly to hold the area until reinforcements arrived from Omaha. While the battle continued on Omaha, further east, British and Canadian troops had made their landings on Gold and Juneau beaches. Here, the objectives were to liberate the town of Bayou, secure the Camp Bayou Road, and occupy the port of Aramanche before joining up with troops from the other landing beaches. Although the British troops experienced some heavy resistance at first, they soon managed to break through the German line of defence and head towards the Canadians on Juneau Beach before marching further inland. Juneau was very heavily defended, and the Canadians had to face the full might of General Wilhelm Richter, who proved a tough adversary for the invading Allies. Within an hour, the Canadians suffered huge casualties, but they fought bravely on, and by noon, the entire division of 14,000 men had landed. The last beach in the D-Day lineup was Sword, which was the furthest east and close to the strategically vital city of Caen, which was key in the battle for Normandy and the gateway to the Seine and Paris. Securing the city was one of the most important objectives in the entire operation and was described by Britain's Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery as the crucible of the battle. Although the sea was heavily mined, the resistance the British encountered at the Sword Beachhead was weak, and the biggest problem they faced was the sheer number of men landing in such a small area. While thousands of troops, vehicles and ordnance were brought ashore, the routes off the beach became extremely congested as the British soldiers began marching inland. One of the best love stories of D-Day is that of Bill Millin, the personal piper of Lord Lovett, the commander of the 1st Special Service Brigade that came ashore on Sword Beach. 
seeing the carnage as his comrades fell, Piper Bill, as he became known, started to play his bagpipes as he waded through the water and all the way up the beach, raising the morale of all those around him. Later, the Germans said they didn't target him because they thought he'd gone mad. But legend has it that he played his pipes all the way to Pegasus Bridge when the men he came ashore with met up with their fellow British comrades. The reality was that the Normandy landings were a huge triumph against all the odds, and by the end of D-Day, 130,000 troops had arrived on the stretch of coast between Cherbourg and Caen, making it the largest invasion to take place on a single day in history. Relief for the Allied commanders at the success of the Normandy landings was immense, and as the groundbreaking news was announced across the world, at least people everywhere dared to believe that the war could end with an Allied victory, bringing a conclusion to Adolf Hitler's reign of terror. It's hard to even begin to imagine the pressure that Eisenhower, as commander of the invasion, had felt. But it's interesting to note that sometime after the event, his valet found a handwritten speech in a pocket that had been prepared in case the D-Day invasion had been a failure. But despite the excitement in the Allied nations, there were also many lost lives to be mourned. By the end of June the 6th, the casualties were being counted with 3,000 men killed on Omaha Beach alone. Today, you'll find the graves of the brave American and British servicemen killed on D-Day, and in the weeks that followed, laid to rest in cemeteries just set back a short distance from the coast, as well as the German casualties some of whom were little more than schoolboys, conscripted in desperation to fight for the Nazi cause. The news of the invasion had a profound effect, not only on the Allies, but also in the German homeland. Those who opposed Hitler began to accelerate their secret plans to assassinate the leader that they believed to have done Germany such a terrible wrong. The Führer himself, and other prominent members of the Nazi party were aware that something had to be done, and quickly to boost morale, which is why the terrifying reprisal weapon, the V1, was unveiled. On June the 13th, Hitler unleashed the unpiloted bombs, each carrying nearly a ton of explosives over the south of England, causing terror and panic amongst British civilians. Three days later, Germany's day of vengeance began in earnest as hundreds of V-1 bombs were launched, destined for London. As the air raid sirens wailed, it would be weeks before Londoners heard the all-clear sound as wave after wave of bombs darkened the summer skies. The pulsating engine of the bombs made a distinctive buzzing sound, giving the V-1 its nicknames including the Doodlebug and the Buzz Bomb. And as people took shelter where they could, they soon feared, above all else, the sudden silence as the bomb began hurtling towards the ground. Although anti-aircraft crews destroyed many of the V-1 bombs, it was soon evident that the fast-moving targets were very difficult to hit. And as the incendiary devices dropped indiscriminately on streets and homes, thousands were killed or injured by Hitler's terror weapon.
Enraged with news of the attacks and fearing for their families back home, the men in Normandy prepared to push deeper into France, more determined than ever to defeat Hitler. Further reinforcements arrived, and as the famous Mulberry Harbours were put in place, the Allies really consolidated their position. Speed was now of vital importance, not least because German intelligence still believed there'd be a further attack bound for Calais, and still had the majority of their troops stationed there. But this would not be the case for much longer. The path was clear for the Allies to strike at the heart of occupied France, and the days that followed the 6th of June became equally as critical if Hitler and his axes of evil were ever going to be defeated. While Hitler had to contend with Operation Overlord in France and the Italian campaign further south, there were also developments on the Eastern Front. By the 22nd of June, the feared Russian Red Army had commenced Operation Bagration. This was the Belorussian Offensive, which aimed to clear German forces from Belarus in northern Russia to Poland. The impact this operation would have on furthering an Allied victory was immense as it destroyed the core of the German army. Around 300,000 German soldiers were killed and many more were wounded or captured. But as the Russian army celebrated the fall of the last big German base on Soviet soil, the aftermath of the victory came fully into view as the utter destruction and desolation of vast areas of land and a once proud people faced decades of rebuilding. Towns and villages lay in ruins throughout the country, devoid of the population who had been killed or taken prisoner. The enraged Soviets forced 50,000 German prisoners to march through Moscow and it took three hours for them to be paraded through the city while the Soviet army thundered into Poland where the Warsaw Uprising was just beginning. With Russian forces coming from the east, American, British and Canadian forces penetrating France, and the Italian campaign still gaining momentum in southern Europe, Hitler's Third Reich was on the verge of collapse. The stream of Allied reinforcements arriving in France had by now reached half a million. But to the great relief of the Nazi commanders, another storm was set to slow down the Allies' progress. The worst gales of the century began battering the coastline on June the 19th, and before long, Mulberry A, the harbour for American troops, was totally destroyed and left beyond repair. As the storm subsided, the march further into France and toward Cherbourg resumed. The two aims of Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery were to capture the port of Cherbourg and the city of Caen, which were still heavily protected by German troops. However, compared to the progress of the Red Army in Russia, Montgomery's advance was alarmingly slow. When Eisenhower arrived at the beginning of July, conflict between the two commanders was very noticeable. With the German forces taken by surprise, and more than enough Allied airmen and soldiers to continue the push for Cherbourg and Caen, Eisenhower could not understand why victory was eluding Montgomery and his men. In response to growing pressure, on July the 13th, Montgomery began planning a new operation codenamed Goodwood, which stepped up preparations for capturing Caen. However, his Nazi adversary, Erwin Rommel, renowned for his successful battle strategy in Africa, was equally as determined to defend the German stronghold as Montgomery was to attack it. There were no less than five lines of defence stretching over ten miles before reaching the city. 
from infantry dug into villages, gun lines along a ridge to the south of the city, and tanks and soldiers waiting on the outskirts. The battle would be fierce, and ironically, the last of Rommel's career. Just a day before Montgomery launched the attack, British aircraft fired on Rommel's car, seriously injuring Hitler's Desert Fox, who was rushed to hospital. As Allied bombers began to pound Rommel's defences in France, there was also a dramatic turn of events in Germany, because Hitler had narrowly escaped with his life when a bomb exploded at his East Prussian headquarters. All those implicated were executed immediately, and many others were arrested and imprisoned. Hitler's long-serving commander, Erwin Rommel, was among those implicated in the assassination attempt. And although it's quite possible he knew nothing of the attack, he took his own life just months after D-Day, rather than face investigation. Nevertheless, Hitler and the Nazis quickly recovered from the shock of the failed assassination attempt, focusing their attention on keeping Paris secure. Although the Germans defending Caen had suffered great losses, while the surrounding villages were left in ruins. Many Germans were taken prisoner, and the ships that had brought the British and American troops to France were now filled with POWs before they made their journey back across the Channel. Eisenhower, by this point, was extremely frustrated with Montgomery and the fact that further advances had not been made. So, he gave the American general Omar Bradley the go-ahead to put Operation Cobra into place on July the 25th. As planes unleashed torrents of bombs and the US troops battled into a position of strength, within a week, General George S. Patton and his troops had also added their weight to the campaign. As Cobra pushed from the north, the highly disputed Operation Anvil was rekindled and renamed Dragoon, because it was said Churchill, who had never thought the idea to be of use, believed the Allies had been dragooned into accepting it. The British had always argued that troops and equipment would be put to more use in the Italian campaign, but as the Allies had now captured Rome, there was no reason to withhold troops any longer. On the 15th of August 1944, it was planned that the Allies were to make an amphibious landing between the towns of Toulon and Cannes. There was a mix of American, Canadian, British and free French divisions taking part in the assault. And on the first day, over 94,000 men landed along the southern coastline. In 24 hours, the troops had infiltrated 20 miles of French soil and captured the very useful port of Marseille. This certainly boosted morale for the Allies and also the ever-growing French resistance, who after so many years of occupation were ready, willing and able to play their part. By the time the 6th of June arrived, the resistance had a free French army of about 100,000 men that was increasing daily, proving very useful to the Allies as they invaded Normandy and in the subsequent weeks during the build-up to Battle for Paris. Their position provided the Allies with military intelligence and they helped sabotage the enemy in any way possible. When Overlord began, the resistance was thriving as the liberation of Paris became a viable option. And by mid-August, an uprising had begun that would herald a great, great day for the French. Charles de Gaulle, leading the Free French 2nd Armoured Division, worked hard to convince Eisenhower to support the movement, and the battle for Paris gathered pace. And by August the 20th, barricades and trenches started appearing all over the city. Men, women and children were helping to carry materials on wooden carts for the resistance, and a patriotic spirit was spreading fast as the dream of liberty became a reality. The liberation of Paris was far from being a foregone conclusion, however. 
because although the Germans in occupation were now severely depleted in numbers, the French lacked weapons and heavy ordnance. A temporary ceasefire allowed a little time for the forces to address these problems, and when battle was reinstated, the resistance fought harder than ever, forcing even more of the Germans into retreat. Hitler, who was shocked and angered by the prospect of losing Paris, demanded that maximum damage be inflicted upon the city, and Dietrich von Scholtitz, who was in charge of the German army in Paris, gave the order for the bombing of the Grand Palais. But such action was futile. The German army was getting weaker and weaker, so General Pierre Bilot, commander of the 1st French Armoured Brigade, sent a message to von Scholtitz with a heartfelt request. In order to prevent any useless bloodshed, it belongs to you to put an end to all resistance immediately. Von Scholtitz believed this to be the best plan of action, but when Hitler insisted, Paris must not fall into the enemy's hands except lying in complete debris, Scholtitz had a terrible moral dilemma to face. Fortunately for Paris, he bravely decided to disobey these threatening orders and allowed the City of Light to continue to shine. Paris was liberated on the 25th of August 1944 and this day has gone down in history as being a vital stepping stone on the road towards the ultimate Allied victory. Patriotism had played a huge role in the battle for France and de Gaulle, who would go on to become president of the provisional government of the French Republic, without doubt knew how to motivate his people. We, who have lived the greatest hours of our history, we have nothing else to wish than to show ourselves up to the end worthy of France. Long live France. From D-Day to the liberation of Paris, and throughout the many battles that had been so bitterly fought in between, these crucial months of 1944 had truly changed the course of the war. An Allied victory would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the bravery of those who fought and died on the beaches of Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. D-Day, as the name perfectly expresses, had been a make or break moment, and the outcome would have been so very different had the Germans been able to stand firm in the face of such a dramatic invasion. From here on, with the path to Berlin laid wide open, the Allies could really see the light at the end of the tunnel, and they knew that victory was now within their grasp.